Hall. I'm CEO of Alliant Group, and that's my day job. Um, I joined the board of Space Center Houston recently, and William, what a ride it's been. And, and you know, I've always been a huge fan of space. Uh, when I was young, my dad made me watch Carl Sagan and Cosmos, and I'm like, Dad, why, why, why? And then you grow up, and you're like, sometimes when your parents tell you to do things, it's, it's right. <laughs> but I love space. I love exploration. I love, by the way, Neil deGrasse Tyson, if you guys haven't heard of him, he is awesome. His humor is biting. He is entertaining. He is smart. But if you ever have a chance to hear him speak, or I don't know, maybe we can bring him on as a speaker or something. He's, yeah, he's, he's amazing. But, but, you know, when you think about the vastness of space and exploration, I mean, I always get super duper excited. I mean, when you think about it, the Earth is 5 billion years old. The known universe is probably 10 or 20 billion years old, give or take 10 or 10 billion years. And, you know, our speaker today, I got to keep wanting to call you Dr. Ambrose, but he wants me to call him Rob. But this guy's so accomplished, I'm having a hard time just calling you Rob. But <laughs> he specializes in AI, robotics. And what sucks is the average human's lifespan is about 80 to 100 years. When you look at being able to travel billions of light years, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to make it there on our own. We're going to rely on robotics and AI. But this spirit of exploration is so exciting to me. It's why America is the best darn country in the world, why I love affiliating with Space Center Houston. And just like I said, every time I step into Space Center Houston, I just, I just get charged up, juiced up, excited. Because, and we at Alignco, we're explorers too, right? We're super passionate about exploring, pushing limits, questioning everything. But I am just fascinated by space, travel, manned space flight, unmanned space flight. I mean, questions like, you know, you guys have heard of Drake's equation. Is there life on other planets? Is there extraterrestrial intelligence? What's at the bottom of a black hole? Is time travel possible? Tonight, all these questions are going to be answered, right, guys? <laughs> <laughs> oh, not the excitement I thought. <laughs> but, but the big thing is, it's not the answers, it's the journey, right? And the journey into space, um, the number one thing from journeying into space that I keep hearing is the number one invention is duct tape, right? Which, okay, cool, we, we need duct tape, that's exciting. But duct tape, so many other medical science life advancements have come from uh, space exploration. So I'm really excited about our partnership. Uh, William Harris, CEO of Space Center Houston. William, you want to say a couple words and we can, Thank you. you can answer all these big questions from everybody and then. <laughs> you, you want to use that one? I think actually I'm live. Oh, I'm you're, wired. You're good. Oh, okay. Because I'm going to be moderating. We're advanced over here. All right. Thank, well, Deval, thank yeah. you. First of all, Deval, thank you so much to you and your team for making tonight possible. We love to come out and tell you about things happening in space exploration, and specifically here at Johnson Space Center, uh, you all need to know, you were in the city that's the home of astronauts and the home of astronaut training. This is a city of innovation, of coming up with new ideas, approaches. And something I always think it's important to acknowledge is that we here on Earth are the greatest beneficiaries of space exploration. There are thousands of insights, inventions, things that we understand that improve the quality of our lives. And so while we invest a huge amount to venture out into space, it is helping us really understand Earth, which is the great blue spaceship that we all inhabit together. So a little bit about Space Center Houston. We are a nonprofit organization, 501c3, and we are also the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. And our focus is looking at space exploration, past, present, and future. We're a STEM learning institution dynamic learning destination where we, of course, give the history because you have to know where you came from, but we really are focusing on where are we at now and where are we going into the future. And so all of us are born curious, inquisitive, and it can kind of get squeezed out of you over time. So one of our aims through our programming is for our younger participants to really sustain that curiosity. We're all innovative and we all can come up with great solutions. So I, I want to acknowledge some of my team members who are here tonight, Kim Parker, who is our VP of Development, Daniel Neumeyer, <laughs> who's our Vice President of Education, Tommy Wright, who's our Director of Business Enterprises. Tommy, where are you? Oh, there he is over here. Uh, Amy Marks, who heads up our membership program. Ray Laval, Ray, where's Ray? He's our Associate, Development Associate. Oh, and Mallory, who is our Development Writer. So we have members of our team who are happy to answer any questions about things that we're doing. But we have this incredibly exciting job to interact with extraordinary people like Rob Ambrose. And so I'm very excited about the conversation we're going to be having tonight with Rob. Yeah, thank you, William. And it was interesting, you know, 
William and I were just a few minutes ago having a conversation. I was like, man, are there aliens? Are they coming for us? And, you know, my thing is, if they find us before we find them, we're in trouble. Because that means they're super more technologically advanced than us, right? So we got to find them first. And William's like, gosh, Duvall, you're so competitive. Uh, I did say that. <laughs> I, was like, I did say we that. we got to smoke true. those aliens. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We'll be friends. We'll extend the olive branch. We will, we will be friends with them first if they'll have us. Right? Absolutely. Well, one thing I said to Duvall was, we used to presume that there were hundreds of thousands of galaxies and universes, but with space exploration, the Hubble um, Space Telescope actually helped us understand there are billions. Yeah. And so odds are really good that there are there's life forms out there or it existed at some point in time or will exist at some point in the future. Yeah. So uh, probability is pretty high. Yeah, so we got to find them first, though, William. Come on, man, because <laughs> they find us first. It's not going to be good news. So... But, but, you know, when you were talking about Space Center Houston and STEM learning, helping youth get more excited in STEM, that's our mission. And when I look at a line group, like we're a company full of explorers, right? Exploration is in our DNA. We have folks that are super passionate, excited. They're super excited to like to meet you and to partner together with Space Center Houston. And, you know, one of the things William and I are working on is, you know, professional, young professional memberships for some of our professionals, right? Getting you more in the fabric of Space Center Houston promoting STEM learning uh, and all that good stuff. So this is this is super duper exciting for me. Um, Rick Lazio, good friend. Rick was a former congressman of New York. When he was in Congress, Rick, you were super passionate about space exploration, right? And you and I talked before about space exploration, JFK. We do things not because they're easy, but because they're hard, right? So would love for you to sp say a couple of words, Rick. Well, thank yeah. you very much. Well, as you said, Duvall, you know, we're all about innovation at, uh, we all, you know, at Lion Group. That's at the core of who we are. And in my office back in New York, I've got uh, a photograph of four astronauts that went up in space with a American flag and they brought it back for me. And so it hangs in my office. And it's a reminder, you know, why do I have that in my office? It's because it's in the DNA of America, right? For to be discoverers, to be first, to be pushing the boundaries, to take on risk and to bring back knowledge so that mankind humankind is is improved. And you mentioned, Deval, that great JFK speech, which you'll remember. You know, it was right here in Houston at Rice University 59 years ago, where in about five minutes, and some of the best speeches in the world are all short speeches. I should keep that in mind, right? <laughs> 30 seconds, right? 30 yep. seconds. <laughs> tick, 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 tick. You know, where he says, you know, we do this, I mean, he's announcing that we're going to take it to the moon. We're going to take on the Soviets that we're going to take it to them and we're going to win this. But we were way behind at that point, right? So we're way behind. No one thought we could do it. But he said, we're going to do this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. Because the idea of us being first and us bringing knowledge back and or organizing ourselves so that we can develop that talent and bring back that knowledge and have a better world, that that's who we are as Americans. And so, you know, whether it's, it's Lewis and Clark, or it was the pilgrims that came across the sea in a relatively small boat, or two people I was honored to know, John Glenn and, and, and um, Neil Armstrong, who risked their lives to bring the best of America to outer space and then back. I mean, that, that's why this is such an exciting proposition to be partnering with both of you. And now being able to leverage you know, robotics and AI to do even more to do even more, go even further, and discover even even greater universes. So that's why I'm all about this. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Rick. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. So, um, Rob, when I heard that you were retired, I was like, dude, you're too young to retire, man. Like, <laughs> you've got, you got another lifetime to live. But very exciting. So, Rob, you retired last Friday. Friday. So this is his retirement party. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> So uh, without further ado, I'm so excited you're here. And when we talk about space exploration, unfortunately right now we can only live 80 to 100 years, but um, with cryogenics and longevity. And yeah, Rick is like, dude, I want to cry. Yeah. Save my head. yeah, Rick is like, can we freeze my head? Can we freeze my head, please? It's future generations need to know. So we're working on it. We're working on it. But super excited to have you, uh, Dr. Ambrose, Rob Ambrose here. So William, without further ado, I will... Have you introduced Rob, and we'll continue on with our program. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so much, Deval. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Well, 
Rob Ambrose, please join me up here so everyone can see you. Why don't we have a seat and then we'll uh, do the introduction. And thank you, everybody. Great. I'm going to pull out my notes. Rob has a resume that is pages and pages and pages long. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but I just want to make please sure don't. I don't <laughs> miss some of the key things. But I think the coolest thing, Rob is actually one of the first people I had the pleasure of meeting when I came to Space Center Houston about five years ago. And one of my board members says, you've got to meet Rob Ambrose, and you've got to have him take you on a tour. And so he was the division chief for robotics, software, and for simulation at Johnson Space Center. And that's a lot to unpack. So basically, he does all the cool stuff related to <laughs> robotics and software development and innovation. But he also had an appointment at headquarters where he worked with all the NASA centers. So um, we're so delighted to have Rob here, who is really one of the leading minds in the world around robotics and AI. And so the format tonight, we're going to have a conversation. And you, we want you to participate as well. We have a microphone set up here. So if you have questions, please come up uh, to the microphone, because I know we're live streaming. And other people on live streaming won't hear you unless you speak into the microphone. And so um, you can do that at any point during our conversation this evening. Uh, and we're going to touch on a few different topics. We're absolutely going to talk a little bit about robotics at, at Johnson Space Center. We want to touch a little bit, as, as Deval has said, about artificial intelligence, um, about um, some of the thing, cool things that NASA is doing. The other part of Rob's portfolio is he also developed all of the very cool vehicles that could be used in exploration on other planets. So, um, you know, the Martian gives you kind of a sense of those kind of vehicles, uh, but they're unique and only here in Houston, the city of innovation. So Rob, again, welcome. Thank you, William. So excited to have you here. So uh, tell you. us a little bit more about kind of some of the, the big projects that you worked on during your time at uh, Johnson Space Center. Well, I, I retired Friday. Uh, and retiring from the federal government is a little harder than it sounds sometimes. Um, but uh, what a, a, a great career, so many good friends, uh, including the people, uh, the robots mainly. But um, <laughs> So we had uh, an incredible breadth of work in the uh, uh, software robotic and simulation division. And we were the youngest division. Uh, the structure at the engineering directorate at JSC is, is we call it the exploded spacecraft, which is not as bad as it sounds. What it means is you take a spacecraft and you break it into all the subsystems. And there's a division responsible for each of the major subsystems. There's power and propulsion, and there's uh, thermal and communication. And so my division was basically responsible for all the things that didn't exist in Apollo. Basically all the new stuff that they only wished they could have had back in Apollo. You know, since Apollo, uh, software has just come of age now. Uh, back in the day, software was a box of these cards with these strange holes punched in it. And I even had Bob Savely, who was our chief scientist, was uh, you know, from the days of Apollo. And, uh, but software has now changed. It's, it's a whole new industry. And I got to be responsible for the software on human spacecraft. You know, what, you know, right out of science fiction. And I don't know why, but it always speaks with a British accent. I haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> clearly should have a, more of a Texas accent. Um, and then simulation, uh, another of our main areas. Uh, back in the day, simulation was a periscope flying over this like astroturf stuff with some little guys. Um, and they had to have a periscope because back then a camera was as big as a refrigerator. So you had to have a periscope with mirrors to get to this giant camera. And then they would move the periscope and they would emulate flying and landing. That was simulation in the 60s. It's, it's, come, a, it's come a long way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, simulation is now, uh, again, an entire industry. Um, we've been doing virtual reality training of astronauts since the early 90s, back way before VR was cool. Um, simulation is now its own industry. And again, like software, it's, it's much bigger. Than, than space, uh, but the investments in software and, and simulation that NASA made in the 60s have really paid off. Uh, you, you might not know this, but in the 60s, NASA was the biggest purchaser of integrated chips on Earth. We were buying like 90% of the integrated chips because we needed a, a very small, powerful computer. And we found a little company, a startup company called Texas Instruments 
that got the early condo. Now, we didn't invent the integrated ch chip, right? But um, nothing like a first contract to kind of get an industry going, right? And, and similarly in simulation, you know, we've, we've invested in VR from the beginning, uh, all the computers to do um, computational fluid mechanics, uh, and all the, the amazing training we do with astronauts. Um, and then r robotics, again, didn't exist during Apollo. It was, in, it was science fiction in 50s and 60s, science fiction was awesome. Um, a lot of robotic content there. Uh, but you know, they could only dream of having the ability to do things that we can do today. Uh, the last attempt uh, to operate the lunar rover uh, robotically uh, was the last chance they had. You know, it, it had it was a disposable rover, but the last uh, couple, two, three times, as humans blasted off to come home, they tried to pan and pitch the camera to record it, and they kept missing. They didn't have the ability to do coordinated time controlled teleoperation. Uh, the guy who was commanding it, the mission control, had a spiral notebook with times and commands where he was trying to guess when to give it the command. And on the f finally, on the last Apollo mission, he got it right. And, and as they blasted off, he recorded. That was the closest we got to robotics in, in Apollo. And uh, robotics, uh, I won't say it's come of age yet, but it's, 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 had, a, it's had a good few uh, decades uh, since Apollo. And I'm really excited about where it's going to go. And in all three of those areas, software, simulation, and robotics, are now much bigger beyond space. But the investments NASA made because we had these urgent needs really helped them all get going. And uh, you know, just thinking in Houston alone, all the industry that's benefiting from those early investments, it's, it's really humbling to think about. Well, it's remarkable how it's progressed in a really relatively short amount of time. We're just talking about a few decades where you're going again from these simple punch cards to the sophistication of what we now find and to think, for example, the International Space Station has been orbiting Earth for more than 20 years. We've had continual human habitation for more than 20 years. There's, an, there's always been a human living in microgravity. And so um, the space station is really an incredible vehicle that's been evolving and growing. So tell us a little bit about some of the robotics that support yes. operations on station and, and some of the things that are being developed. So, so my division was created for the space station. Uh, in the, it was created in 1990, and I wasn't there yet. I was still in college. But uh, the division was created to go build the space station, to form a team of astronauts and robots who together would build this International Space Station. And the early assessments, as they kind of uh, laid out, uh, like a construction project, how you would lay out the planning, um, it was unattainable. You know, the, the amount of uh, spacewalking hours was was just going to be completely impossible. So they finally said, "Okay, you know, you know, we're the home of astronauts. We get it, but they're, they're going to need some help." So this, so we redesigned the space station to be built in more modular pieces, more like shipping container sized pieces, rather than assembling it in such smaller parts. It's harder because now you've got to launch much larger chunks. Uh, but then, with some very large robot arms, we were able to put it together. And the, the team was the astronauts driving the robots and then out in spacesuits doing some of the fine dexterous work, knitting together all these modules with the plumbing and the electrical connections and, and blankets. Um, we're so proud of that, that uh, record of having had humans and robots working together to go build the space station. It's, it's, it's uh, a remarkable achievement. And as you mentioned, you know, we've had humans in space continuously ever since. Uh, but we're now looking at, a, at a, a new one that I think will be an even bigger achievement. Uh, the, the next step isn't just humans and robots building something together. It's the robots build it, and then the people arrive. And that's what you really have to do when you're going deeper into space. If we were to try and do the same human-robot team deeper into space, it would take so long, so many hours of people in space. This ability to now pre-assemble, pre-deploy, and then have the people arrive uh, is, is, a, is a huge challenge, uh, but it will open up all kinds of new approaches to exploration. And then they don't have to stay 100% of the time. You know, it's kind of like, like a, an adventure like climbing to the top of Everest. If you just think, you know, for the heroes who make it to the top, 
we all know the real heroes are the Sherpas that push all of that material up the mountain, right? And they're much better climbers. But after they've put all that, pre-deployed all of that equipment, the, uh, you know, the rich kids come, I'm sorry, the summit team comes through. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and they, you know, they, they you know, the, the Sherpas position enough logistics that they could even wait out a bad few days of weather. And then they spend tens of minutes on the summit. Imagine if we wanted to keep a team of six on the summit of Everest year round. That's a lot of Sherpa hours, up of material up that mountain. And then you got to wonder, what would they do on the summit for that, right? So being able to pre-deploy, as far as we know, there are no Sherpas available on Mars <laughs> yet, right? So, or on the moon. So it's going to have to be robots. They're going to have to pre-deploy the equipment, and then the humans will arrive. And because of that, for the same price of continuous habitation in low Earth orbit, we will be able to have uh, a space station much deeper in space uh, where the people go do their work, work that only humans can do, and then come home. And the robots will take care of them. They'll set it up. They'll be the caretakers. And they will help the astronauts when they're there. And then for the long periods of time between missions, the robots, they've got it. They're going to take care of things and keep everything running. So that's, that's our next adventure. And we're seeing it for the moon. You know, being able to go to the, the lunar surface and, and stay, it just will be with, you know, we'll, it's not like the Martian. We'll never leave a guy behind like that on purpose. <laughs> I mean, we'll never leave a guy, but we'll leave the robots behind. And we will have a continuous presence. It's just going to be a mix of the humans and the robots and the AI working together. Well, for background, because not everyone may know, NASA's current priority is a return to the moon. The program is called Artemis. Artemis is Apollo's twin sister. And the plan is within the next three to four years, uh, deploying astronauts to the moon. There are going to be several missions leading up to that. There's actually a launch later this year of Artemis 1. And that is going to be an uncrewed mission where they'll, this is a proof of concept, they'll send the capsule, the Orion capsule, to orbit the moon and return to Earth. And then we'll do it with a crew the following year, all leading up to when crews mm -hmm. go there. But the big difference is the architecture they're looking at now is to have a type of space platform called Gateway that will be in an elliptical orbit around the moon. And so we'll launch from Earth to the platform, and then there'll be a shuttle between the platform and the lunar surface. And that enables the astronauts to land at any location on the moon. And the goal is to actually establish a long-term presence at the South Pole because there's millions of gallons of frozen water. And we want to understand, is that water potable? Can you drink it? Can you use it to grow food? Um, and so that is, is the big goal. So I'm curious, Rob, are you, with the research you've done, have you been looking at a version of a robot that could go ahead to assemble those habitats Absolutely. on the South Pole? And we've learned so much assembling station, of course. Um, <clears throat> again, it's, it's all about how you break the thing into chunks. If we, if we shipped it in the most efficient packing form, then, as they say, some assembly required. Actually, a lot of assembly required. So it's, it's how big of a piece do you deliver it in. And uh, if you've been paying attention to some of the, the, the private companies, their ambition is to be able to launch some pretty big chunks. So if we can deliver five, ten, maybe bigger, um, five, five or ten ton chunks, then our assembly operations could be pretty, pretty efficient. Uh, and again, they would be delivered uh, without humans there. So um, uh, one, of the, one of the things people have not heard much about is our cargo program on station. Again, another wonderful thing we've learned from station. You know, the human missions rightly get a lot of attention. Uh, but we've had these robotic cargo vehicles that go to the International Space Station and take tons of cargo. Um, they are the unsung heroes of this last decade on, on the space station. It's been a really good decade for robotic missions. Um, and what they allow is a very inexpensive delivery of equipment to the space station. I, as, as a division chief, I had something on every mission going to the International Space Station. Um, I, I was responsible for all the exercise equipment, which are kind of robots that work with people. Uh, we had spare parts and, and equipment going, you know, new, new computers, every single mission. Um, and that's like every three months. And the delivery was so flexible that if we were ready 
to deliver the spare parts. Uh, we would get them on this flight, or we'd have to wait three months for the next flight. It's logistics. It's being able to manage it like a logistical train. And that these robotic cargo vehicles have just been amazing and opened up all, all sorts of opportunities on station. So now we want to project that. Same, same the commercial market that will be providing the landers that deliver the cargo uh, and uh, frequent and low cost access. You know, what a great time. If, if only I were in my, my 20s, um, you know, what a great time to come into space and into the space in, uh, industry uh, with access that's so readily available to be able to get your, your designs and your equipment into space so quickly and so easily. It's, it's an amazing time in, in, in space development. Well, I wanted to point out, all of you have been seeing on the screens next to us, kind of scrolling imagery. These are all projects that Rob and his team have worked on. Yes, in, fact, so in fact, there's our exercise device called ARED, um, very popular with the crew. Uh, it's a multi-use kind of exercise machine. It was not, I did not, I didn't get to test it in space, <laughs> but I did operate it on the ground and it's much harder on Earth. In zero G, it's, it's, it's different. Um, but you know, you can imagine if you don't use your muscles for six months, uh, you're gonna feel it. So uh, the astronauts, in some measures, are now coming home stronger because you know they're they're they have you know, more structured time, let's just say, on on, on the space station. So they're then they're they're really working out. Uh, some of them are doing two hours a day. Uh, consequently, I got to send a lot of spare parts because you know they're real hard on the equipment. But they are really working out, and they're coming home in 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 better shape than we could have ever imagined. Uh, and that that research with our um, our space life sciences health uh, performance people uh, has really changed the astronauts' health and the ability to operate in a world that we didn't evolve for. You know, we're um, we're really counting on one G gravity, uh, and so when you get into zero G, it affects the body in all sorts of ways that are surprising. Uh, so our exercise equipment has has been really effective. Um, a number of other machines will flash by uh, exoskeleton. Uh, that young lady is wearing a, a 50 kilogram exo that she d designed and built herself uh, with her team. Um, the initial application of that was a uh, spinoff of the Robonaut uh, technology to make a lightweight exoskeleton. Uh, we're kind of working towards being able to build uh, the actuators into a spacesuit. That's my long term goal. There's some gloves that we built. Uh, we integrated the glove and tendon actuation. Uh, together in a spacesuit. Uh, the exoskeleton, uh, the, the, eventually it will be part of a spacesuit someday. But in the interim, it was a really good exercise machine. It was designed to, to pick the weight of a suit up and help you carry it. But we can just reverse the logic and it puts the force down. And when you wear that exoskeleton, we can dial it in and suddenly it feels like you have 200 extra pounds on your back. And you and when you start doing some deep knee bends, you feel it. You feel the burn. If you got an extra 200 pounds on your back, but it's only a 50 kilogram machine. Watch out Peloton, right? Oh, Here oh well. Like the <laughs> they've, they've been calling. And uh, you know, if you've seen, you've seen there is a lot of innovation in exercise equipment, right? And, and it's, it's, it's uh, the digital stuff, right? You know, how to engage the people, how to monitor, the, the, the actions, and it, it's very robotic and human-friendly robotic, uh, working with people, um, and it, it has to be safe. You know, that's one of our core values at the Johnson Space Center. Uh, the projects we did with, with Robonaut were with General Motors, and their vision was, like our vision, is not to replace people or get rid of people. Uh, the, the goal was to have people working sh literally shoulder to shoulder with robots, and so they have to be safe. If you're going to be, you know, they're strong robots. They've got to be strong enough to do work with people. And if you're going to be um, in the workspace of that robot, you've got to have confidence in it. So that was a shared value that we had with General Motors. Uh, we developed, they, they, they moved a bunch of Detroit engineers to my lab in Houston. And we built uh, from the scratch um, a, a, a safe control system that had three independent ways to feel a contact and pause the robot safely. Now you may have heard something about three laws in robotics. Uh, these were different laws, but the robot obeyed them. 
And uh, with three independent ways, if, a, if the robot was minding its own business and an astronaut bumped it, it would pause and everything was fine. And it's running all the time. And now that approach, even though the robots on assembly lines in Detroit don't look like a robot, uh, that, that approach to safety is being applied to industrial robots. So we've got some, some robot and, and NASA DNA uh, in Detroit now. I think I've heard the Bitcoin, the anti-kill. It's a little strong, right? A little strong, but because, we're, we're uh, well because uh, the machine's doing its job, and if you get in its way, it's going to keep moving, right? Uh, so this was so it has this em sense emphasis of, on the anti. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it has to be safe, and uh, and again, uh, human safety is is so important at the John Space Center. You know, our our tradition is um, to to have astronauts do the hardest jobs in the solar system, and then bring them home safe. You know, that's really what we're about. And it turns out, versus all the other NASA centers that are all just awesome and, and we really like them, that the, the human niche that we have at the Johnson Space Center is really good for this planet. Uh, there's so many jobs right now in Houston that are very hard jobs that people are trying to do. And they want them to be able to do them safely and, and be able to go home at the end of the shift to their families. You know, what a great opportunity. You know, we're focusing on just some really high end and, and extreme jobs to be able to take those technologies and apply them to all the jobs that we're doing here on Earth. You know, that human connection that you've got at the, at the Johnson Space Center really makes that possible. And that's different than all the other space centers. You know, they're, they're remarkable and they're doing great things in their own right. But that human connection is really unique to JSC and it's a great opportunity for the region. And just for a point of background, NASA has 10 major research centers across the country. Each one has a particular specialty or focus. They all work together. Uh, the one here is focused on everything related to human exploration. And so the robotics support the human exploration. I, I wanted to pivot a second to um, a topic that we all are hearing a lot about these days, which is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of curious, how would you define artificial intelligence? Well, so what's most important to me is learning. So a system that doesn't have to be pre-programmed, where you don't have to anticipate every possible thing and every combination of all the possible things in a very deterministic way, which can be combinatorially explosive to try and anticipate every possible problem, um, is just prohibitive. So something that can learn and adapt is what I think of as interface as artificial intelligence because life's pretty good at adapting and the ones that are still left are pretty good at learning. Uh, so that's why I think of a system that has the ability to learn and adapt is an artificially intelligent system. If it can just compute really quickly, well, that's good and it's very useful. But it, I don't think of that as intelligence. The ability to reason and adapt and make choices and learn and get better. Uh, that's what I think of as artificial intelligence. And the technology is now becoming available. But it's typically today in niche areas. You know, learning about my furniture and having the robot vacuum. <laughs> cool. You know? <laughs> Um, I like it, but it's a pretty narrow application, right? But that's a reasonable thing to start with. And so we're in an era of commercial robots that are going to be more single purpose machines. That they're, they're narrowly uh, effective and functional. And <clears throat> if the price point of the machine crosses the value, we're buying them, right? If that, if that robot vacuum cleaner costs less than your value of time vacuuming, you know, you might want two. Um, so where we will go next is where we start to see multi-purpose machines. Things that, you know, you might buy it to vacuum, but it also is uh, keeping an eye on the dog because they do the darndest things. Right, and so a, a vacuum cleaner that you can also use to keep an eye on your house and see what's going on. Um, yeah, you know, that's and if you if you start 
searching on the, the latest vacuum cleaners, and guess what they can do? You know, you can operate them from your phone uh, from anywhere in the world and go see what's going on at the house. Um, and it'll be knitting together these kind of capabilities. Uh, but again, you will not have them in the house except for, you know, only certain, you know, robot geeks maybe, um, unless it really pays for itself. It's, it, the, 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 the value to you is going to have to make that, that crossover the price point. And that's the way uh, commerce works. If you think of Model T, when the, the price point on the Model T crossed the value to the average person to be able to get around town, people started buying it. And that's, that's really the, the power of uh, commercial development. Now, well before that, you had uh, non-commercial um, non vehicles. You had, you know, there'll always be the tycoons that had the V16 engine, you know, well before the, the Model T, and they push the technology, and they're and they're critical to make things happen, and we're seeing that in space. You may have heard there are some uh, billionaire rocket enthusiasts who are quite excited <laughs> about space, um, but but again, I think that's a clue that there's something really important going on in space right now, and the tycoons they they've spotted it, and so they're getting in. Uh, when, when the getting's good, uh, they they can feel that something's going on, and uh, I'm I'm all for it. You know, I I think that extra energy and the excitement uh, is really good for for the space industry, and we're going to see it in robotics. Um, you know, there there are the uh, you know the breakthrough machines. Um, you know, like we followed Dean Kamen with this Segway. Um, you know, if if only we'd all had electric cars back then, you know, the Segway would have been an obvious thing to plug into your electric car. And especially in Houston, when you get out of a parking lot in Houston, you're still a quarter <laughs> mile away, right? And, you're, and you can't drive your car, you know, so you know, having that companion personal mobility that would plug into your electric car, you know, it, 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 he was just ahead of his time maybe, but uh, you watch the personal mobility space. With all these advances in electrical power and battery and smarts, um, personal mobility is literally going to take off. And you know, a lot of what we're doing in rovers and, and robotics is feeding off that same set of technologies. And the investments we're making at NASA on how to build robotic systems, mobility systems. People don't think of rovers as robots, but I assure you they, they're robots. Um, and uh, I just bought a new truck. It's an amazing robot. It's an amazing machine. And just stand by. Your car, you know, you think of it as a single purpose thing, you know, it moves you around. Cars are now starting to have all kinds of other functions that are coming into them. And so it's that connectivity where the machine diversifies out of just that single function. Um, for a rover, it's keeping the astronauts alive. You know, it's got all kinds of important roles to play uh, with the astronauts. And if you read the book, The Martian, or the, or the movie, um, the rovers were really an important part of that, of that book. Uh, and yeah, the, uh, the author, um, he based them on some of the, the rovers, the rover in that picture. And uh, uh, they were, my, yeah, I, I think they were the stars of the book. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it's a great time to be in, in robotics and Back to your, your, your question on artificial intelligence, as we start to see multiple jobs coming together that a, a single machine can do more and more for you, the way it interacts with you, talks to you, listens to you, works with you, will become more and more important. And uh, uh, we're going to find machines that are in our lives today uh, that have been minding their own business, not a lot of change, you know, the toasters not really changed much in the last 50 years. Uh, hold on, you know, these things are going to be doing a lot more than you would have ever imagined. And uh, turns out the robots are all around us, we just didn't recognize them. Well, I love the idea of the RoboGuard. I think that's a really great one. <laughs> I, I, I'm not going to tell you which brand to look up, but uh, if, if you, you study robot vacuum cleaners, they're out there and uh, all sorts of new capabilities. And I actually saw that first in Korea, uh, in uh, more than 10, 15 years ago in Korea, which felt a lot like Texas. 
you know, the dense, I, maybe I, I just spent two weeks in Japan. So I, it was all spread out in Korea. You know, there was wide open spaces and big cities with lots of miles between them. But all the people lived in these high rises along rivers. And everybody was this, these apartments. And they all wanted a robot in their apartment. And this is like 2007, 2008. All these entrepreneurs in, in the Korean robotics sector were building these apartment robots that you would be able to operate from your computer. But that was really before the smartphone. Now you connect it to a smartphone and anybody could operate these machines. So they all wanted to something that was puttering around their apartment while they were at work. And it was just amazing. Every, every, every uh, lab that I went to, they had companies trying to build these robots to monitor people's apartments. Uh, so the, I, I would say uh, South, South Korea was way ahead of, of where you know, we were with uh, having robots in our homes. And I, I think we're going to see a lot more of that. Fascinating. Well, I want to be sure we give you all a chance to ask questions. I, well, I'm having a great time talking with Rob. <laughs> I hope we you're always enjoying the conversation as well. We always have fun talking to each other. But if you do have a question, please come up to the microphone. Yes, please. First, thanks for being here. How do you create resistance? So I didn't catch the name of your workout equipment, but how do you create resistance in a zero gravity space? Okay, so dumbbells are out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> You know, the, 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 uh, the, we've tried a number of different things. We've experimented. Um, we've tried flywheels, but they're complicated. Uh, we've tried bungees. Bungees, you know, the, the early investment NASA made in bungees for exercise have, have gone to market, right? You know, a lot of um, bungee-based exercise. Uh, but a bungee is not recording a lot of information. And... And this is, and this is really important. It only can apply a force in one direction. So the key to the way the human muscle works is to be able to apply force in both directions as the muscle is contracting and expanding, to be able to provide resistance in both of those directions. Um, uh, it turns out an electric motor is completely controllable. It, you can apply torque in both positive and, and negative directions. Uh, so I, I saw some amazing machines that were being built to try and do this. Uh, one group was working with the NFL. They built a, they, they took a forklift, and these guys are pretty strong. They put a forklift, and it was above a bench press going up and down. And they put a load cell on the tines of the forklift, and they were printing out the force display. And they told this guy, put it on this line, which was about 300 pounds. And so as that forklift was going up and down, his job was to keep the line, his line that was measuring him, on the 300-pound point, both extending and, and contracting. And the workout was just brutal compared to a dumbbell, which is you know, only going to work in one, one direction. Um, you know, that is called concentric and eccentric loading. And, and, and an actuator uh, can apply those loads uh, in both positive and negative direction. But here's another key, well, two, two of the key advantages. A robot, even a one-motor robot, can measure it all. And our flight docs love the data. <laughs> so we have all the data of every single push that the astronauts do. We can record it and see how they're doing. And then learn and adjust their exercise. So they're always pushing uh, and, and, and getting the most out of their workout. The other advantage is, turns out dumbbells are heavy. <laughs> Very heavy. And so a motor can apply the same force with a much smaller mass motor than a bunch of lead weights. And you know, we're, so we're not going to send a lot of lead weights to the moon or, or Mars. But motors can apply those same forces in a much more economical mass package. Um, so now what you're starting to see, have you seen some of these devices that have tendons with motors and a, and a, and a computer mirror kind of an interface that you're looking at with all your data? That's, that's where we've been you know, for the last uh, few years, developing robotic exercise equipment. And it's, it's again, it's uh, you know, taking something from one industry, one, one niche, and applying it to a different problem. Um, uh, it's, it's fascinating. And, and again, we've had a great partnership with our, our uh, space doctors who are just loving the data that is just flowing off of these machines where they can see everything about 
the exercise that the astronaut's getting. It, it's really, really awesome. The other thing is when they start it up, they already have their prescription. So they already, everything is already planned. They don't waste a lot of time horsing around with the machines. Or when they, they turn it on, it's, they see their picture, they know it's them. They're not doing the other guy's exercise. It's them, and uh, it's good to go. It records all their data. And uh, we're now starting to see that here on Earth. So I wanted to uh, qualify to you, like why the astronauts exercise. And in large part, it's because our bodies are amazing. Our bodies are the most incredible machine. And our brain is constantly monitoring all of our systems and constantly rejuvenating ourselves. And it has to make decisions around use of energy. So when you go into microgravity, your body all of a sudden says, oh, there's no gravity. I don't really need my bones. And so you start leaching calcium mm -hmm. and minerals, and you can get space osteoporosis. And so the exercises astronauts do are to tell your brain, no, I need my bones and tendons, and I need my skeleton. So what we're learning a lot about physiology through space exploration and applying it here. And then you know, Rob, of course, is talking about this tech transfer, which happens all the time as a benefit of space exploration. So another question. Hi. Hi. I actually have two questions. One is personal and one is technical. So I'll start with the technical one. About the exoskeleton, is that what it was called? Yes. yes. So are you, is it being used for spinal cord injuries? Interesting. So um, we built, so the, the one that's been in these pictures mm -hmm. was a lower body. Okay. And it had a, it kind of like a backpack with shoulder straps. Mm -hmm. So we could apply forces at the waist cinch or up to the um, shoulders. We also developed an upper upper extremity device, mm -hmm. and we actually did it as a partnership with Peer, okay. which is an amazing group amazing. Uh, in the medical center, mm -hmm. um, and the Texas Institute for Rehabilitation and Research, mm -hmm. and Rice, so a friend of mine at, at Rice University, uh, Marcy O'Malley, uh, Dr. O'Malley, and it was his upper extremity. So uh, we're kind of working our way around the human. We've got these awesome shoes, Happy to tell you about shoes. Robot gloves, uh, lower extremity XO. We've got um, the upper extremity that was uh, a partnership actually with DARPA mm -hmm. for um, uh, rehabilitation of uh, people with trauma and helping them relearn how to use their arms. And in that case, the, as it was a robot and it, it controlled uh, three degrees of freedom of the shoulder, three motions of the shoulder, and an elbow. And the way they do that now is it takes a couple people. And what they do is they try and move the human through a very uh, rep repetitive motion. They, they're measuring range of motion. They're doing it kind of not even with a protractor. And they're having to manually move the, the limb. The robot does it much better. It, of course, records everything. And so the therapist sits next to the patient and is talking to the patient and working you know, cognitively with the patient. The, as the robot does all of the motions and then records the complete data run, it's also easier on the therapist. It's really hard work having to hold a person and, and move them. So it was all about helping, uh, in this case, soldiers relearn how to use their, their upper limbs. Um, the, that glove that we built, <clears throat> we actually took it to several uh, VA uh, rehab centers. And the hypothesis, and we, we've now licensed this technology as a spinoff, but the hypothesis was that as a person is in a coma, um, if, they, if we do nothing, we're just working on their head, mm -hmm. okay? When they come out of the coma, if you look at their hands, which are not as important, okay, but when you look at their hands, they're, they're contracted tightly. And I get it. They're more focused on the head, right? But when they come out of the coma, their hands are just a wreck. Because over months, the hands have tightened up. So the hypothesis was if once a minute the glove opened and closed the hand, yes, mechanically, the tendons are all probably still good. But there was, the hypothesis was that stimulation might help relearning how to use the hand. Because again, the human body is just an amazing machine. And having a person sit with a, with a patient and once a minute articulate every, impossible, right? Right. But here's a glove robot that once a minute for months 
to be articulating the hands and helping them come out of this traumatic experience they had going into a coma. So a, a very exciting project. Uh, our goal was just to be able to add power steering to the astronaut glove, because uh, it's, it's really hard on the human hand. Um, and people below a certain age don't know what power steering is. They think it's called <laughs> steering. <laughs> but you know, being able to move the glove. And then here's this great spinoff. And so we, we licensed the Robo Glove, which was the NASA invention of the year last year. We licensed it to a company called BioServo. And we're, we're, we're hopeful that they're going to do some great things with it. We also heard from all kinds of industries that needed robot gloves for manual work, too. Uh, so it's, again, it's a, it's a product that could have all sorts of other uh, implications. So, so that, so. Um, Thank you. So that, yes, we're, you we're, have segued perfectly into my other question. So you graduated in 1991, and you just retired. Does it make you very old? What's next? Well, um, so uh, funny. Um, <laughs> I graduated from UT Austin, oh, 1991. Lawrence. Me too. My Not wife. 91. My wife graduated in '92. Okay. Um, so obviously, uh, I started at Texas A&M this week. <laughs> <laughs> are you doing graduate work, or are you I, teaching? I, 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 uh, uh, they've offered me an endowed chair. Wow. So I'm going to be the, the Walker Chair of Mechanical Engineering in the Mechanical Engineering Department. Congratulations. It's great for all of us. Thank all you. Right. Still got a lot of good friends at UT Austin. And uh, they're, I've been on the External Advisory Committee for the ME Department there, and they're still talking to me. Really. Uh, <laughs> well, I see Duvall has, has stood up because I think we're getting close to the, the end of our time. but. Um, we could go on for hours. I love talking with Rob, as you can tell. And he is has had such a remarkable career. And he's going to go on to continue to do great things and mentor others and continue to mentor others. Because he also, I should say, was really active with STEM programming yes. while he worked at Johnson Space Center and was really key in advancing a robotics club with high school students. Yes. He's been very active with us. And I think he's a great example of the type of activities that Space Center Houston tries to advance to really engage the public, people of all ages, in all aspects of exploration. And um, it, it doesn't matter what your background is. You could be humanities major. You may be in social sciences. Um, science is the fundamental for learning everything. It's about having a question. It's about testing that question, getting information, coming to some conclusion, deploying that in some way. And so it's really the underpinning of learning in all disciplines. And that's why we're so passionate about it at, at Space Center Houston. So I want to thank Rob for coming out and having a conversation with us tonight. Maybe if Deval will have us back again, we'll continue I would, this. I would love that. So any more questions? Jeremy, you wanted to ask about whether there's aliens here on Earth already or? <laughs> no? Yes? You're embarrassed? <laughs> oh, oh, all right, all right. No, th this, was, this was really fascinating. I love it. Would love to have you guys back. And um, guys, I mean, aren't you all excited? Isn't the spirit of? Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Uh, uh, the spirit of exploration is just amazing. And I think William, you know, we talked about before. It's not necessarily finding answers; it's the journey. Because um, the question you asked was great. I mean, are there applications in the life sciences field, the health field, the medical field? Um, what's really interesting, I didn't even think about it, but if those of us that have been around stroke patients or family members that have had a stroke, this is real. And I didn't even think about that, but that would be supremely helpful just to have a robotic device that stretched and moved something. So you guys can see it's not just space exploration, but the tangential discoveries are amazing. So, you know, with that being said, you guys know I'm super passionate about this, space exploration, all the tangential and ancillary discoveries that come from it. and um, you know, William, you and I were talking before, if you ask any engineer, is time travel possible? They'll say, yeah, with enough money and enough time and enough resources, I can build you a time machine. So if you look at all this stuff, we talked about Andy Weir and the Martian and Artemis and all these fantastic science fiction journeys, the one thing is they need resources, right? And for me, you know, there's a lot of folks that are peddling a lot of causes. This one is awesome. It's one I believe in heart, soul, body, and mind. William, you do such a fantastic job sharing the vision. Dr. Ambrose, sorry, Rob. Um, just the stories you tell. I mean, I, I can tell that none of this is scripted. It's all, it's all from here. So, you know, I 
19 years at Alliant Group, right? I've never asked anybody to contribute anything. This is a mission I believe in. If you can find it in your heart to contribute to Space Center Houston, I would appreciate it. William would appreciate it. Some of these science fiction stories will pretty soon, they won't be science fiction, right? They'll be reality. So, and the applications are numerous. So supporting Space Center Houston any way you can, I would appreciate it. We would appreciate it. And, and this stuff, I mean, the biggest thing, my, my favorite quote of all time is Van Gogh's, I sleep, I dream, I wake up, I paint my dreams. For me, this conversation, I mean, I got a lot more to dream about yeah. and a lot more to get up and paint. So if this conversation inspired you guys like it inspired me, you know, let's contribute to the cause. I'd love for our partnership to grow closer. You know, hopefully you can use our wonderful space, our building. I'm super excited. But this was amazing. Gentlemen, big round of applause. So excited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was fun. <laughs> and of course, Casey Curry, thank you so much for putting all this together. <laughs> Any more questions, comments, issues, concerns? <laughs> Made in USA, okay. Yeah, and um, Rob would love to continue this discussion with you offline. And, and like, we, you know, we, we have tons of robotic companies and defense contractors and artificial intelligence companies that we're working with. So at some point, we'd love to pick your brain because look, this is a space I'm very passionate and excited about. We'd love to help them, so that'd be great. Love to help. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Okay. William, thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everybody.